My shirt, black. My pants, black. My soul, black. My skin, uh, on all levels but physical, I am a black wing. Hey everybody, Joseph Rothschild here, aka MBT, back again with another episode of 10 Minute Testing. Today I've got a doozy for you. Sometimes we can fall for the trap of assuming the format's solved by virtue of nothing but three months of exceptionally specific data. But sometimes the evidence doesn't tell the whole picture, as shown by this week's, and I'm not making this up, Blackwing National Top. So let's check out Blackwings. So here's the list, and huh, this is actually pretty reasonable. I was kind of expecting to have to once again grapple with my old nemesis, reading, but I'm happy it's just a bunch of cards that all do the same thing. As always, I'll give you a background about the archetype, a little bit of a discussion about what I hope the deck can do, and of course, the card by card. So firstly, for those of you that don't know, Blackwing is a series of avian adventurers meant to be used for synchro summoning. More importantly, however, they're also the inferior predecessor to battle wasps. The ones who have earned a spot in our main deck fall into two categories, extremely impactful normal summons that represent at least two materials, and monsters with basically no effect that special summon themselves from the hand. We're playing as many of the pair of these as possible to ensure we always have the requisite material for both win-con for decks that want to interact good and also do other stuff good to the Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardish, as well as Blackwing Full Armor Master, a card I can't believe they printed a Towers that wipes the board and takes control of opponent's monsters. This list is scrubbed from Silent Blackwing, a Blackwing player from Finland that either hasn't yet received the news that they're still printing Yu-Gi-Oh cards, or just trains in the hyperbolic time chamber. He just wrapped up an impressive and unprecedented top four finish in the Finnish WCQ with this strategy, proving that it has legs, or talons, or at the very least that he's a signer in the flesh. So with that, let's get into the card by card. Firstly, we're on 3C Moom, the Poison Wind, who is just completely busted. By banishing a Black Wing, he sets a Black Whirlwind, then Normal summons himself, immediately triggering it without wasting your precious Normal. After that is 3 Ouster, who's the best search target for said Whirlwind in the world. She specials a monster from your banished zone when Normal summoned, effectively guaranteeing any hand with C Moon gets you all the way to the full combo. She can also be banished to add wedge counters to your opponent's monsters, which Master removes to to destroy them. Next up is Steam the Cloak, the best banished target and staple card despite the conspicuously absent Crystron Needle Fiber, followed by our last normal summon, a 1 of Blizzard the Far North. For specials, we're on 3 Bora the Spear, 3 Hamaton the Dust, and a searchable 1 of package of Chris, Gale, and Oroshi. Finally, we're on both Phantom Knights and two Ash Blossoms. For spells, we're on three Black Whirlwind, which is still absolutely bonkers. It's a non-OPT searcher that often nets you four cards over the course of a turn. That's followed by Allure of Darkness, which both helps find and set up Ouster, three Desires, three Called, one Reborn, and one Upstart. For traps, we're on two Fogblade and one Shade Brig. In the extra deck, you want to load up on Blackwing levels and statuses of tuner versus non-tuner to account for any potential setup. As a result, we're only on four links, Bard, two Wee Witch, and a Link Haribo for Steam's token. We're also on 1-4 Evil Swarm Nightmare to proc Bard in best case setups. For Synchros, we're on Sohaya for five, Nothing for six, Rakhiri, Black Rose, and Joe for seven, Omega, Beals, and Boral for eight, and two Full Armor Master in case they out the first one. So with that, let's jump into the games. Our first match is up against Super Quant, a deck that is poised to be particularly problematic provided they receive all of the support they've been promised. This is going to be a Tower's Mirror, and in the game of Towers, you build, or you break. Our opponent is going first, let's see just how high they can build. They'll lead with a copy of Alphan, they'll activate Alphan's effect to get a copy of Green Layer from deck. This triggers both Green Layer and the grave effects of White and Red Layer. This is going to engineer a board state where White Layer is on their side of the field, Blue Layer is special summoned from hand, and of course Magna Carrier is added from Blue Layer. They'll then activate that and Instant Fusion for Millenniumize Restrict, and Magna is on board. After that, they're going to trigger about 15 Grave Effects that I don't understand, and then activate the effect of Magna Carrier to go into White Layer. They'll then e Telly for Blue Layer and end on Gram Pulse. This represents both a piece of Spell and Trap Destruction and a piece of Monster Effect Negation at instant speed. We should be able to play through it, we're going to lead with a C Moom. Unfortunately, Black Whirlwind is about the only good target for Gram Pulse, so we will lose it. This triggers the effect of Blue Layer as well, shuffling a bunch of these back. We'll activate Pot of Desires to draw a couple of cards. We find Allure of Darkness, we'll then Normal Summon a copy of Ouster, getting back Steam, and go into Wee Witch. 
Twitch. We'll use the Grave Effect of Steam for a token, go into Link Rebo and go into Bardish. This is number one bait material. Of course, you have to negate Bardish, which means after we called by the Grave this white layer, we are free to special summon this copy of Harmattan from our hand and go into Armored Master. We'll activate Ouster's Grave Effect to put a wedge counter on everything our opponent controls and take their best monster before going into Steam the Cloak, Bola, and Raikiri. Raikiri is going to be able to destroy the field spell, the last card we can't get over. We'll attack over one of their monsters and destroy the two remaining with Armored Master's effect at end step. Our opponent draws for turn. They're going to lead with a copy of Green Layer. They'll special summon a copy of White Layer. Of course, its effect is negated. They will link summon a copy of Tour Patrol from the Underworld and will ash their Green Layer effect, running them out of cards, and they'll concede. While the first game did an excellent job of showcasing just how adept this deck is both at setting up and playing through multiple pieces of interaction, the second game shows off its major weakness. We're going first against Endymion, which is better than going second against Endymion. We'll lead with a copy of Allure of Darkness, banishing a copy of Steam the Cloak so we can special summon it back with Ouster. We'll do just that. Our opponent doesn't have any hand traps, so we can pop off as hard as possible. We'll activate Hamatan and Oroshi the Squall. We'll go into a copy of Wee Witch, activate the Grave Effect of Steam the Cloak, go into Link Rebo, and go into Rusty Bardish. We'll activate his effect to set a copy of Fogblade, banish the Silent Boots for a second one, go into Full Armored Master, and set our hand. This is what most of your setups will look like. Our opponent will lead with a copy of Empress of Endymion, activate Terraforming for one, Magical Citadel for two, and Magic Lab for three. They'll then activate the effect of Empress to special summon an Endymion from hand, and the second effect of Empress to pop one of our traps. Thankfully, they miss one of the relevant ones. They'll activate Magical Citadel again alongside a Pot of Desires, and they find a Tuner. That allows them to go into Borlode Savage Dragon. Now, while there's no Link Monster attached, this card does have 3,000 attack. Perhaps you see where this is going. Our opponent is able to set up two active Endymions, which means that we are not going to be able to use our two pieces of interaction to prevent it from making it to the battle phase. They're going to return one, and then when we activate the other, return the other. That's really, really, really bad news for us, because it means this Borload Savage Dragon is now free to eat our full armor master, and their Endymion is free to eat our Bardish. They Pendulum summon the second one before going to their end phase. We draw an Allure for turn, that's okay, we'll activate Fogblade, just trying to fiend for negations at this point. We draw a copy of Monster Reborn, which would be great if they didn't have multiple negations up. That's unfortunate. I guess we can style a little bit. We'll special summon Steam the Cloak, use Ouster's effect, and then we'll concede. Have you figured it out yet? Full Armor Master is not very good at combat. Our best of three versus meta is up against a deck designed to exploit that weakness, Orcist. Our opponent is on a particularly interesting build of the deck. They're playing Burning Abyss Monsters to make Cherubini before they pop off the Orcist way. They're going to lead with a copy of Ancient Cloak, special summoning a copy of Psychic Wielder from hand before going into Cherubini, setting a copy of Graft Graveyard, and special summoning a Seer from deck. They'll then special summon a Skarm from their hand, overlay into Dante, and then Link summon a copy of Cerberus. They'll activate Dante's effect and Seer's effect, special summoning back Dante and returning Seer to hand before going into Mermaid and using its effect to fetch an Orcus Nightmare from deck. They'll go into a Galatea, a Beatrice, and then activate Nightmare's effect to send a copy of Diver, special summon a copy of Scared Zone, and go into Rusty Bardish. They'll activate Rusty Bardish's effect, setting a copy of Fogblade, and adding a copy of, you guessed it, Silent Boots to hand. They'll bring back Galatea and set a copy of Climax before overlaying for a Dingarisu, resetting this copy of Scared Zone from their Banished Zone before they special summon a copy of Silent Boots, link summon a second Galatea, fetch another Fogblade, and special summon... <laughs> <laughs> Hydra Lander, of all things. We're going to try to pop off regardless, and we should be able to. They're going to climax our Sea Moon. We're going to activate the effect of Ouster, which, admittedly, is always going to get fogbladed, but we still have the juice. We can Synchro Summon Full Armor Master with Harmaton, and then put a Wedge Counter on every card our opponent controls. I really want that Hydra Lander, but unfortunately, they're able to destroy it in response. At end phase, we will wipe the board. I keep the call in hand for the Beatrice effect that never comes. Unfortunately, they can still go off from this position. A Regeki is just not good enough. They're able to special summon way more than enough monsters to make our natural predator. See if you can guess who it's gonna be. That's right! It's the one! The only! Boral Sword Dragon. They're then going to bring back Dingarisu, use Dingarisu's effect to reattach the copy of Wand of all things and go to battle phase. Remember, Boral Sword Dragon gains the effect no matter what. He'll get in for 15, they'll get in for a significant amount, and the second attack will be more than enough to finish me off. Alright, so it's time for game two, and oh my god, this hand is useless. Okay, well, we are going first, and interruption's important. We're going to activate Black Whirlwind, normal summon a Hamatan, and add the only thing we can, Oroshi. We'll go into Wee Witch, set two, and pass. 
Our opponent's going to lead with a copy of Danger Jackalope. It's going to be special summoned, and then they'll activate Snack. Afterwards, they'll go into Nightmare Phoenix and hit our Fog Blade, of course. We are able to call by the Grave, which means our opponent is not going to be able to activate the effect of Orcist Nightmare and pop off. Well, we might just get the Bard Beats in this game. We're going to set a copy of Fog Blade and go to battle phase, attacking over our opponent's Nightmare Phoenix, setting a copy of Shade Brigandine, and passing. Our opponent's going to set a card and pass it back. Things aren't looking that miserable. We draw more interaction. We're going to activate the Grave Effect of Fog Blade, but unfortunately they have the Call by the Grave, so we're just left with the Shade Brigandine on our side of the board like an idiot. Always wait, kids. We're going to set two cards and pass it back to our opponent. Unfortunately, they now have five monsters in Graveyard, and they're free to special summon a copy of Hydrolander. Well, Fog Blade it, but they ah, are able to destroy the Fog Blade in response. We'll activate Fiendish Rhino Warrior's effect to send a copy of Skarm, which we will banish in the end phase with our copy of Called by the Grave. We need anything off the top that deals with this, and we find Steam. Okay, we don't have any targets for Black Whirlwind, but it does make Black Rose Dragon. That at least deals with the problem. We'll do just that and hope for the best. We'll activate Fog Blade's effect to bring back Bardish and activate Steam the Cloak's effect to bring back Steam the Cloak, but this isn't even close to lethal and our opponent needs so little to pop off that it's frightening. We'll activate the Grave Effect of Climax, getting a copy of Hydrolander. That's mega cute. We'll activate World Scepter to bring back Nightmare, Normal Summon a copy of Diver, go into Galatee, activate Diver's effect to get a copy of Scared Zone, go into Rusty Bardish, activate Scared Zone's effect to bring back Galatee, use Galatee's effect, and God, I don't want to sit through this. So we're back with the deck, and, well, I don't think I could have spelled it out any better than that. Let's do the pros and cons. First, the pros. One, it is a remarkably reasonable option against a significant amount of the current metagame. Very few decks have a clean out to unaffected cards. Two, it's consistent. The Black Wings do a great job not only of providing flexible setups, they do fantastic work baiting and chewing through hand traps and interruption. Even worst case opens can finagle together a lone full armor master. And three, it's cheap. Nothing in this deck is prohibitively expensive, so if you're looking for a cool off-meta entry point to competitive play, this might be it. And the cons. One, I mean, you saw it, it's Boral Sword Dragon. Everyone's on him, everyone theoretically can make him, and he eats our master alive. And not only does he not have to affect our monster to gain attack, but he's unable to be beaten by battle, which is just icing on the cake. The cake in this case is a store-bought supermarket one with sorry about your towers piped on. Two, it does remarkably little playing on its opponent's turn. I mean, sure, it can dual wield fog blades in a best case scenario, but decks are more than capable of chewing through that. In a world where if you're allowed to pop off you can do so for 12 minutes, a handful of random Blackwing chaff is pretty pathetic to look at. And three, games are pretty samey. Even the ones you win are just a few turns of sitting on a towers and repeatedly getting your other synchros negated, and that's, I mean, that's hardly fun. All in all, it's an extremely linear deck with a good matchup against anything that isn't playing Boral Sword. If you can pull a Kaiba and tear every copy to shreds, go for it. Otherwise, leave the Black Wings to our Finnish overlords. So that's that. While I appreciate all of my viewers, a special thanks to my patrons, especially Colin Whalen, Michael Salmior, Adam Trevino, Ace Enigma, Adrian Bra, Distrin, and Lucas Geerdes. If you want to see me play the decks I make on this show on stream, I'm on twitch.tv slash mbtygo every Monday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.